Douglas, for the cover piece this week, you have written about the culture wars infiltrating museums. What's been happening? Well, I start off with a, um, a description of going to the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford this past week. Uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum has always been an interesting oddity of a museum, a collection of, of, of mainly 19th century uh, collected artifacts. Uh, it's, um, it, it was a, a place famed, among other things, for the pickled heads that it had in it. And even as an undergraduate more than 20 years ago now, uh, it, was, it, was, it was known of as being an oddity, but an oddity from another time. Um, and I discovered on returning this week that it's now become uh, an oddity of our own time. Uh, the museum is filled with condemnations of the museum. The collection is filled with condemnations of the collection. Almost everything tells you about the sins of European colonialism, European racism. There are, of course, all of the nods to the religion of our time. There are segments on beyond the binary, because I'm sure that's what everybody wants when they go to the Pitt Rivers collection. And we see, for instance, anime characters from the 1990s who are strong queer icons. Uh, my point is that the museum is effectively abolishing itself. It's saying that the collection was put together by bad forces and it has to be saved in the modern era, reinterpreted and indeed accused. Now this, as I say in my cover piece this week, is not at all unusual. It is something that is going on at collection after collection and museum and muse after museum across the land. And the oddity of this is not just that this is in fact encouraged by, for instance, the Museums Association, which, which tells collections in, Europe, in, in the UK how to, quote, decolonize. But of course, that the collections themselves are doing it. We just saw last weekend the Welcome Collection on London's Euston Road announcing that it was closing its exhibition. Why? Because it had tried to decolonize, but it couldn't tear itself away from its dead white male origins. And so the Welcome Collection announced that it would be closing. It couldn't justify itself, so in the end, it stopped. Ed, you've read Douglas's piece. What did you make into his deep dive of what's happening in museums and the collections that are present there? Well, I've got a huge problem uh, with Douglas's piece, which is that I agreed with quite a lot of it, so it's going to be quite hard to have an argument. I think if one unpacks it, I mean, Douglas has used some pretty forceful examples to make his point, as you would expect from uh, one of the country's most successful columnists. Uh, and I, being a sort of bland, neutral, slightly flabby figure, uh, sit somewhere in the middle of this, which is that I get engaged in the culture wars because I think, to a certain extent, both sides take rather extreme positions. I think that it is, in the 21st century, perfectly possible to look at a museum collection uh, that was accrued, say, in the 19th uh, century or the 18th century, and say, how did this museum come by these objects? Were they taken fairly, purchased in good faith and transported back to the UK, or were they uh, looted by British soldiers? And if they were, is that something that we should consider when we put these things uh, on display? And one of the reasons I get asked onto programmes like this is because I'm in favour of returning the Parthenon sculptures, the default position which to a certain extent, to coin a phrase, every schoolboy learns is that Lord Elgin saved the Parthenon sculptures and that they would have been blown up by these feckless, uh, or been allowed to be blown up by these feckless Greeks if Lord Elgin hadn't intervened. I don't think that's an accurate depiction at all about how the Parthenon sculptures came to be in London. And even if it was, I think now in the 21st century, uh, a perfectly reasonable request from the Greek government to potentially have them back should be considered um, in a sensible way. But I do think as well, and this is where Douglas may well disagree with me, so we'll get some juice out of this, uh, that it is worth thinking about cultural seven, uh, sensitivities in the 21st century. I mean, he cites the Rex Whistler mural at Tate. Now, I wasn't a trustee of Tate when the trustees made the decision to close the restaurant because the images of, uh, uh, in the mural were deemed to be offensive. But I respect their decision. It wasn't taken lightly. It was thoroughly uh, examined, And I'm afraid it is the case that in the 21st century, a lot of people wandering into the restaurant and seeing Rex Whistler's mural, regardless of the context, would find those figures offensive. And it was on the table to have an explainer or whatever about why those figures were there. Uh, but it was considered very carefully. And I, I support that this is the key point. I support trustees looking at these issues 
uh, and making decisions on that basis. But he, I fully concede to a certain extent, uh, and indeed I have trolled my own museum Tate, uh, sometimes the labels go completely over the top and are bordering on the ridiculous. Um, let me just, if I may, pick up on two things there. First of all, what I'm writing about is a different issue than deaccession. Deaccession is its own issue at the moment. I think we would disagree on the Elgin marbles. But deaccession, of course, has already led to its own types of lunacy, such as, for instance, the belief that all bronzes from Benin must be handed back. This came to the, ex the extent that uh, uh, two, a couple of years ago, after the summer of George Floyd, uh, Lambeth Palace got rid of two Benin bronzes, handed them back to Benin, when, in fact, these bronzes were gifts to Ronald Runcie, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who, as it happened... Uh, uh, christened me as a boy. Um, uh, they were given to him in the 1980s and he handed them back as if... Uh, his successors, rather, at Lambeth Palace, handed them back a couple of years ago as if they were holding on to a set of stolen hot televisions. Uh, secondly, what uh, Ed Vesey mentions about... Uh, I'm glad he s says that I use strong examples in my piece and I'm sure he'd expect that. There's no point in writing and using weak examples. Uh, but the example of Tate Britain, um, I think, uh, with all due respect, Ed is entirely entirely wrong about. The Tate trustees took the collection with extraordinary levity. The trustees of the Tate are ignoramuses to a man and a woman. Every single one of them, and let me explain briefly why. The Rex Whistler mural was commissioned in the 1920s. It includes two tiny figures of black children clearly in distress being pulled by women in frilly frocks, laughing. It's clearly, as any scholar or fan of Rex Whistler knows, something he does in all of his murals, which is to say, et in Arcadia ego. This is a, 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 um, a fantastical, idyllic scene in which he deliberately, across all four walls, puts in tiny details to say, even in this alleged paradise, the worm of human evil exists. The trustees of the Tate did not consider this. Who they listened to were two activists on Instagram from a group called White Pube. White Pube's slogan is F the police, F the UK, F the Tate. Now, I don't need to tell Lord Vesey, F the Tate is not a chant you often hear on the streets of London. Most people don't have that strong views on Tate Britain. This was a malevolent, tiny group of activists who decided to defame Rex Whistler. The trustees of the Tate, far from looking into this, immediately got scared. They closed the room, they took Rex Whistler's name off it, they defamed him, first of all, as a racist, and then put up a sign saying that he had the racist views of his time. Why why do I mind this? Not just because the Tate is meant to house and look after one of our great collections, but because Rex Whistler died childless fighting on his first day in Normandy in 1944. How dare one of the great collections of the UK be in the hands of people who would defame as a racist somebody who joined up on the first weeks of the war in 1939 and laid down his life fighting Nazism. These people are not looking at these things carefully any more than they have the example of Stanley Spencer, who they've also decided to defame in their collection as a racist. These collections are in the hands of people who are unworthy of the things in their care. Ed? I think that is, I think now <laughs> Douglas has slightly descended into Caricature. I mean, I wasn't a trustee of Tate when this decision uh, was made, but the idea that uh, Tate would make a decision to close this restaurant uh, and uh, remove the mural, which they haven't done, by the way, uh, is... No, I know they haven't uh, done, but they uh, looked on the into idea that uh, somebody had put up an Instagram... <laughs> two activists had put up an Instagram post uh, is absolutely laughable. And I see nothing wrong with museums, first of all, thinking hard about how a collection is viewed by an audience in the 21st century as opposed to an audience that visits uh, in the 19th century, and that could include uh, the shrunken heads at the Pitt Rivers uh, Museum. Uh, and I think it's perfectly uh, in order for uh, museums to put in context how objects were acquired by that collection and, in fact, the context of the time in which they were acquired. So I see uh, absolutely no problem... Uh, with that at all. And I think, uh, so I think that it's, it's uh, the idea that you wouldn't modernise your displays and your collections and put them in context in the 21st century, I think is uh, laughable. The idea is that our museums should kind of sit in aspic and be exactly as our Victorian forefathers uh, visited them before uh, seems to me laughable. I'd like to ask you each a question to challenge your perspectives. Um, and Douglas, to you first. 
This point about context is important, isn't it? Um, putting aside some of the more extreme examples where they've just decided to shut down collections, would you have an issue with uh, curators deciding that rather than shutting things down, they would like to give a modern context um, and they would like to give more information to those visiting the museum? I mean, presumably that is their remit, of course, um, so that people really understand what they're consuming and perhaps some of the atrocities behind what they're consuming. Oh, yes, absolutely. By the way, Ed Vasey sets up a straw man, as politicians of his kind always do. No, nothing you um, would ever do, Douglas. <laughs> no, I don't need to, believe me. I don't need to. Um, he sets up a straw man by pretending that I or anyone like me thinks that we should preserve our collections in aspic. I don't believe that at all. I think that trustees obviously always have to reinvigorate and renew collections. What I think is strange is that they should hate the collections which they are in charge of. Again, I come back to the point. I followed, unlike Ed, extremely closely the activities at the Tate in recent years and also observed extremely closely the way in which they decided to make Stanley Spencer, one of the other two great artists of the 20th century in their collection into a posthumous racist for no good reason at all. So yes, that's what I find strange. But to get back to your point, Kate, the interesting thing about this word retain and explain thing is, it's absolutely fine and admirable, so long as it isn't a one-directional political hit job. And let me give you an example of what a one-directional political hit job looks like. If you want to, for instance, say, uh, uh, parts of this uh, museum were put together uh, by, in an era of colonialism in Europe or colonialism in Britain, fine. Who doesn't mind that? I don't mind that. I don't think anyone would mind that. But here's what I mind is when you, for instance, as at the Pitt Rivers, get that, and then a strange silence on everywhere else in the world. For instance, the Kingdom of Benin, which has already come up a couple of times. If you stand before the display on the Kingdom of Benin in the Pitt Rivers Museum in Oxford, do you learn anything about slavery? Curiously enough, no. Do you learn that the Kingdom of Benin was practicing slavery long after the British Empire decided to abolish it and sent its ships across the seas trying to stamp it out anywhere else? No. And you would leave believing that the rest of the planet lived in Eden until the wicked Europeans arrive. It's not education. It's self-flagellation. I think that uh, without wishing to descend into cliché, two wrongs uh, don't make uh, a right. And um, no, it is up to us it. to put into context the collections that we have in this country and how they were acquired. And 99% of them were acquired uh, perfectly uh, legitimately. And it's a great thing as well that we have these British institutions that display uh, an extraordinary range of artefacts and paintings from all over uh, the world. But I think when the Benin bronzes were looted, uh, that we should own up to that fact and think about returning them. But Ed, some of the Benin bronzes were given to this country by the Prime Minister of Nigeria after independence. What do we do with those? Uh, well, I mean, I'm not going to... Uh, I don't know enough about Robert Runcie's well, Benin bronzes. You haven't thought about it enough. But if he... Uh, if, uh, if they were acquired legitimately... I mean, it's a matter of a Lambeth you Palace... Just... If they were, if they're their possessions, what they what, what they wish to uh, what they wish to do with them. And I have two questions for you, Ed. First is, um, do we not risk by removing so-called offensive artwork, um, losing parts of history, losing those uncomfortable offensive parts of history? Uh, do we not risk suggesting that these things never happened at all? And actually, to a more fundamental point about offense as well. Since when is it wrong for art or great works of literature to be offensive, to challenge us, for us to be uncomfortable with what we see? If we decide that such works are too risky for people to be exposed to, what are we going to be looking at when we go into museums? What's going to be there to challenge us? I think it's a very fair challenge and I think it's a very nuanced debate and to a certain extent you should do it um, object by object. I think, as I say, I wasn't a trustee when uh, the Tate trustees considered the Rex Whistler mural, but they clearly took the view that these were effectively racial caricatures and no uh, attempt to put them in uh, context or whatever would necessarily uh, reduce the offence that a modern 21st century audience, whether it's black or white, would feel when they were coming in uh, to have uh, a nice lunch at Tate. So they'd taken that decision. And I think, you know, what I want to get across there, I think Douglas is to be frank, being very, very unfair to think that this was a sort of decision taken 
uh, you know, in a nanosecond. Um, I'm being wild. Over, over a couple of um, digestive biscuits and a cup of tea. I think it was thought through very carefully over very well, many Can I ask Ed months. what he thinks about the Stanley Spencer By case? the trustees. Can I ask uh, what, Ed what he thinks what about, I would the say about Stanley Spencer, Spencer case? As far as I'm aware, Stanley Spencer is still on full display at Tate Britain and is yes. not called a racist in, by Tate or anyone else. I can assure you, this is very important with a former arts minister because you have to be on top of these things. I'm sorry, but as with the Benin Brontes, you have to be on top of this. The Tate well, I am on top of, of the Benin Brontes. You know, the Horniman Museum has just returned the Benin Brontes to Nigeria. Nigeria yeah. hasn't thrown up its hands in horror and said, you shouldn't return the these. Tate You've got them perfectly legitimately. Uh, and I'm on top of Stanley Spencer in the sense, as I say, Stanley Spencer remains on full display at right. Tate and Would is you... not called a racist. Yes, he is. Go down there today, if you have the time, and you will see that his masterpiece, The Resurrection at Cookham, in, in the accompanying description, as I say in my piece, claims that Stanley Spencer used racialized images of black people. Now, it doesn't bother to say that in this extraordinary masterpiece, as I'm sure you'll agree it is if you know the painting, in this extraordinary masterpiece that displays the, the, the resurrection of the dead on the day of judgment in Stanley Spencer's church, nearby churchyard in Cookham, it shows people of all races emerging from the grave. You Again, aligning, as this is you aligning, uh, you know, calling somebody a racist... That is not calling him a racist. Go back to the quote I give in the piece. As with Rex Whistler, they look at the work in their, in their, tr in their care with the most hostile lens imaginable. There was nobody black in Cookham in the 1920s. I just, I'm so sorry, Stanley Douglas, Spence, I have to disagree Please with you let me that. finish. Finish your point, add response. I'm going to ask one more question and then we're going to wrap up because we're well over time. Douglas, you have 30 seconds. A reasonable estimation of the Spencer painting in the Tate is that because there was nobody black in Cookham at the time, if you wanted to show the resurrection of all of humanity, yes, he relied on photographs from National Geographic. Does that make him a racist? Obviously not. Is it what he is impugned as being by Tate? Yes. It's right by the painting. I don't agree that's the case at all. We'll go down and see it. To Ed and Douglas, uh, Ed to you first. Do you think that the uh, way in which museums are now curated and the way that art is presented to us has become too politicized? Or do you think that the interventions that are taking place now are crucial to a modern understanding of what happened in the past? Well, I started this uh, debate by saying that I agreed with a lot of uh, what Douglas wrote in his article. And as I say, I think that the extreme positions are taken on uh, both sides, and I think that on one side, questioning or uh, referring to the fact that you know some objects were acquired in by dubious means were somehow being unpatriotic and unBritish, or as Douglas is uh, in terms of working himself up just now, you know that we're going around calling Stanley Spencer a racist. I think is ludicrous, but at the same time, I do accept that there are plenty of examples in our museums at the moment. Uh, where people have taken it to the other extreme and there are kind of gratuitous uh, labels and narratives that don't really fit. You know, I am quite woke on these issues. I mean, I see nothing wrong, for example, in terms of GCSEs and A-levels in extending uh, the English literature curriculum towards world uh, literature. I don't see anything wrong with those kind of things and people foam at the mouth if you dare to suggest that children in British schools might study authors who... Uh, weren't born and bred in uh, Britain and wrote from outside. So I see nothing wrong with uh, looking at our curriculum, looking at, our, at the objects in museums, putting them in context and extending the range uh, uh, of objects that people see and uh, reimagining the narrative. Douglas, to what extent should politics feature in museum curation? And to what extent is it inevitable? I mean, ultimately, the people making these decisions will come with uh, not a neutral point of view. Uh, and, and you're always going to have some uh, lens put on what is presented to you. Um, the job of trustees of a collection is to ensure the continuation of the collection is to know that it is in your hands for your generation to pass on to the next one. I say in the piece how extraordinary it is that so much of what I describe has gone on under a Conservative government. And I think Lord Vasey has just demonstrated why and how it has Please gone Please call on. me Ed. But, but as I say, I think that essentially what we have is 
that our national heritage is to a great extent in the hands of people who don't much care for it. Evelyn Ward, a famous essay in the Spectator reviewing uh, St Stephen Spender's memoirs, said, said that, that reading Stephen Spender, mangling the English language, was like watching a, a, a very valuable vase in the hands of a chimpanzee. Um, watching our national collections and their trustees and curators at the moment is like seeing all the most precious things in our culture in the hands of chimpanzees. They are utterly unfit for the task they've been appointed to. Ed and Douglas, thanks for joining me.